I'm a development manager at Riot Games. I'm part of the champion team on League of Legends. Now, League is a multiplayer competitive game where players select a champion and then duke it out 5v5. Today, what I'm going to share with you is how we create those champions, the kinds of challenges that we face as a team, as well as some of the learnings that we've had along the way. And I just want to acknowledge right at the start, 30 minutes is a super short amount of time to accomplish that. So I'm going to, I'm going to move pretty fast, um, but I'm going to do my best to save some time for Q&A at the end. And I also want to propose that this can be the start of this conversation. I'll leave my contact info up at the end. If you guys want to keep talking, I'm more than happy to after this presentation. All right, so like I said, I'm a member of the champion team. Here's a recent photograph of us. And when I look at this photo, I think two things immediately. One, I'm a terrible photographer who like, can't get everybody into the frame, and everyone's blinded by the sun that they're looking at. Um, but I kid you not, this was literally the best photo that I had out of like dozens to review. So that's, uh, that's as good as I got. The second one is it really just sort of strikes me how lucky I am to be able to present this information that I'm about to share with you. you know, I'm really honored to be the one to give this presentation because this is not my work alone. This is a work of many people. So I just want to acknowledge that. I think you know, what we lack in our photogenic ability as a team, we make up for in other ways. And one way in particular is our dedication to our mission. On Champion Team, our mission is to engage and excite players with champions that deliver innovative and resonant experiences. And I think innovative is pretty explanatory, um, but I'm going to spend a minute or two talking about what we mean by resonant champions in just a moment. And you know, this mission has changed over the years. We haven't had this forever. The needs of players have evolved. The needs of our organization have evolved. And so our mission has as well. But something that stayed very consistent at Riot is our desire to have empowered teams. Empowered not just from a creative perspective, but that's super important. Also empowered from a process perspective. Basically, we believe that the best people to figure out how to achieve this mission is the team itself. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. How does our production process sort of support us in getting to this mission? I'm not really going to get into our creative process much or our design thinking. I want to let you know if that's something that you're interested in. There's a talk tomorrow morning for, um, with Greg Street. I think it's in North Hall, 10 AM. Definitely check that out. He's design lead on League of Legends. If that's um, something you're interested in, go see his talk. On League right now, we have 134 champions. And for players of League, you know, investing time on one of these champions is really meaningful. It's a competitive game. You're playing to win. And so we really want to make sure that when players are committing their time and resources into a champion, that we're giving them a really resonant experience back. And that means from the first game that they play on a champion to their 300th, we want that champion to have a deep and meaningful and fun and interesting experience for you. And unfortunately, there's just no formula to creating innovative and resonant champions. I wish, I wish that was this presentation where I could be like, and here's the formula, presentation over. Unfortunately, not the case. Here's a few champions that really resonate with me um, and that I like, personally really like. But we have found that even though there's no formula, you know, there are some things that really do help support us in achieving our mission. And that's what I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going to share some of the challenges that we have as a team. And I think that you know, these are challenges that are pretty universal to our industry and really to any creative team. So as I go through these, ask yourself, if you've heard these before. The first challenge is, are we there yet? This sort of question on a team that's, that bubbles up from time to time of, do we have what we need in order to move forward? Do we know what done really looks like? How long should we be brainstorming? How long should we be in production? And what this illustrated for us was that we were lacking some clearly defined deliverables as a team. And the second challenge that we face is, that'll never work. So there are times when you do want to hear that on a team, 
maybe you're trying to implement a new technical feature, and so that's like a great conversation to have if it's gonna work or not. But there are times that you don't wanna have that conversation. Maybe you're in a brainstorming or like in a really R&D mindset. And what this illustrated to us is that as a team, we really wanted to be able to have a shared mindset because one of our biggest challenges is moving from an R&D mindset into a production or execution mindset. We're doing that constantly on Champion Team. There are times when we have six champions in development at once in different phases. And so aligning on what we should be thinking about, what kinds of conversations we should have, was really important to us and a challenge that we wanted to solve. And finally, let's not do that again. No matter how awesome a champion development process we've had, there's always, I would say, a dozen times at least where we do something we're like, man, can we not do that again? And we'd all sit down and we'd say, yeah, we're not gonna do that again. And inevitably, we would do it again. And so what this illustrated to us is that we lacked a sort of system that helped us capture our current learnings for our champions that would help us for our future champions and really make sure that we weren't making the same mistakes again. We realized that, you know, these aren't the worst challenges to have as a team, right? But altogether, they were sort of sucking up some creative energy on the team. And that, that brings me to the first learning that I want to share with you today, which is, as a team, we discovered that structure empowers creativity. We are pretty wary of process on Champion Team, and I think with good reason. We don't want things to get in the way of our creative process and being innovative. But when the lack of structure starts sucking away some of our energy from being creative and into sort of like the process stuff, that's where we sort of draw a line. And so the question for us, and this is where that asterisk comes in, is really like how much structure and what kind? Because what we found ultimately has worked best for us as a team is defining a very basic framework to operate from. And this gives us like a foundation to stand on so that we can focus our creative energy on innovating on top of it. So we realized we needed a framework. And so we started to create one. And here's how we did that. As a team, we talked about what are the natural moments in a champion's development life cycle. There were some pretty natural sort of like beats that we would go to. And we, we called these phases. And then we asked ourselves, what are the right goals to have during each of those phases? And we wanted to create goals that felt crisp and clear enough that we could say, are we able to achieve this in order to move forward? Finally, we created a list of all the components, all the deliverables, all the things that we're gonna go into achieving that goal. And this is essentially our framework. And if it looks simple, I'm glad it is super simple, and that was, that was one of our goals. We wanted to make something that was easy to create, easy to understand, and easy to update. But as simple as it is, it's given us a ton of benefit, and so I wanna sort of highlight what those benefits are. The first for us is clarity. We don't ask anymore as a team, are we there yet? Because we know where we're at, and we know what deliverables we still need to achieve, and we know what our goals are. The second benefit we've gotten from this is scalability. As a team, we're now able to quickly align on what mindset we're in and what phase of production we're in, no matter which champion we're talking about. And it's also helped us with our partner teams outside of champion, and I'll, I'll give you an example of what that looks like in just a few minutes. And finally, flexibility. So because this is sort of a simple framework, we're able to quickly update it, add deliverables, remove deliverables, when we're making a champion so that it helps us for our future champions. And it's really the combination of all of these benefits that's helped us become more creatively empowered as a team. But it's also helped us become more autonomous, which I think is like a nice side benefit. You know, we're really able to hold ourselves accountable to hitting these goals and to completing these deliverables because we define them. So here's what our framework looks like. This is the champion framework, and it's essentially a big list of everything we need, when we need it, and why. And I'm gonna take you through a case study of one of our recent champions that sort of walks us through how we, how we really use this framework. And I have some examples of the deliverables that we 
we go after in each phase, I'm not gonna talk about all the specifics. In some of our phases, there are over 50 deliverables, and it would just be too, it would just be too much detail and really dry and take forever. So, before we get into that case study, I do wanna take you through the basics of how we think about champions, the sort of core of every champion. Each champion has what we call DNA, which is the design, the gameplay, narrative, the lore or personality, and the art, the audio-visual experience. And it's the combination of all three of these elements that create strong, resonant champions. And when these are really, really unified, when these elements really support each other, we call that thematic cohesion. And thematic cohesion is a really important ingredient in achieving a champion that resonates with people. Everything just sort of feels right from their gameplay, from their story, from their art. And I'm, I said I wasn't gonna talk too much about our creative process, but I do wanna mention briefly that on our team, good ideas can come from any one of these angles. We've had some great champion concepts start with a gameplay mechanic pitch. But we've also just as often have started from an awesome sketch from an artist that illustrates a champion we've never seen before or from a short story from a writer that takes us to a place in our universe we've never been. And it's that kind of creative versatility that's really important to us, and so we needed a framework that had flexibility as a core benefit. All right, so I'd like to introduce to you the case study that I'm gonna take you through. This creepy, gorgeous fellow is Jin the Virtuoso. He's one of our recent champions. And I wanted to talk about Jin today because he's a great example of being thematically cohesive. And he's also resonant with players. But also the framework that we built and that you just saw, a lot of that was developed and informed during Jin's development. Before Jin was known as Jin, he had a code name internally, and that code name was Deadeye. So let's go all the way back to the beginning of our first phase that every champion goes through and we call this phase discovery. Here's some early sketches of what Dead Eye looked like right at the beginning. And our goal in discovery is to create a pitch that's clear and concise and gets the team really excited about making this champion. And the first thing we do in every champion's development, our very first deliverable is called the opportunity space. We found that it helps us creatively to have some like guide rails up as we're searching for that new innovative champion DNA having a specific place to start looking is really helpful. And so the opportunity space we defined for Deadeye was we knew we wanted to make a marksman champion. This is a gameplay role. We knew we wanted to deliver on a gameplay mechanic, this fantasy of long range sniper sharpshooter gameplay. We have some champions that do this in League already, but none that really excelled at it. And so that felt like a good opportunity for us to go after. And third and finally, from a narrative perspective, we wanted to make a champion with a dark and sinister personality. That's not something we had done in quite a while, so we were excited about that. And so through the discovery process, the team is iterating and we're creating new ideas and throwing out ideas. And here's an example of you know, one of the sketches that we sort of aligned at at the end of the discovery phase. And I wanna share with you the first pitch that we had as a team. Our pitch for Deadeye was, he's a mysterious, robotic, bounty hunting, sniper, cowboy guy. And I totally, in retrospect, see how this is not a particularly clear nor concise pitch. But our framework really helped us out here because it allowed us to say, hey, we all are on the same page here in terms of our mindset and what our goal is. We know that we don't have to like overwork this concept right now. We're all aligned that this is just our first draft and it did get us excited. So we were able to move into our next phase of development, which we call ideation. Now our goal in ideation is to take that concept, refine it, but then also back it up with an in-game prototype. And we create these in-game prototypes by sort of Frankensteining together old models and abilities from previous champions and um, visual effects and sound effects, and we cobble them together, and we try to squint and, and create a gameplay experience that we can say, yes, this is fun, this is new, this is interesting. We found there's just no substitute for an in-game experience. 
One of the ways that we really validate and hold ourselves accountable to proving that is that we have a deliverable in ideation that we call pattern lock. This, this is a design deliverable. And pattern lock has a bunch of things in it, but one of them that's really key is this idea of identifying the strategic identity of the champion. Essentially, why would you bring Deadeye to a game versus 133 other champions? And we have to prove that out. We also want to lock and understand deeply three out of the five core abilities on that champion. So we set a pretty high bar at this early stage for making sure that we really understand from a design perspective what's going to make this champion fun, interesting. A lot of our champions never make it out of ideation, but Deadeye did, and so we moved into our next phase, which we call pre-production. Pre-production is, I think, the hardest phase for us as a team. And it's hard because we're sort of straddling two different mindsets at the same time. We're still in sort of an R&D phase in a lot of ways. For example, you can see this, um, this blue proxy model. This is a quick model that we create and put in the game based on concept art that helps us get a sense of the silhouette and the overall shape. And we're making them taller and shorter and changing all sorts of things to get the right feel. But we're also in kind of a production and execution point of view as well. And you can see that in the middle concept uh, image where we're really trying to refine explicit details on the costuming and really lock down some decisions there. And our goal here is to come out of pre-production with a really clear pitch and plan for how we're going to build this character in our next phase, which is production. And because this phase is so difficult for us, we have a lot of interim deliverables that we've created along the way as a way of sort of helping. And this helps us keep moving forward, making sure we're on the right track. And before we get into production, though, I want to share with you our final pitch for Deadeye. This, I literally copied this out of an old PowerPoint that I found. Um, we have a log line, which is Deadeye is a mysterious Ionian drifter. We've got a mission statement. We've got these things that we call pillars, three pillars. These are creative touchstones that we use as, on the team to help us sort of understand what's in and what's out on the champion. The three pillars that we had for Deadeye are artist and killer. So this is the sense that like, he sees beauty and death. That's a core part of his character. Deliberate action. Deadeye is super precise and explicit and specific with what he wants to do. And we wanted to really sell that and make sure that that came through in his gameplay. Finally, the lie. This helped us understand his motivation and what kind of personality he has. Why does he wear a mask? What's underneath that mask? And it's the combination of all of these deliverables together that helps the team align on what we're trying to make. I think ultimately what we ended up making for Deadeye or for Jin was a character that really excelled at this idea of a deliberate artisan killer. But we couldn't get to that level of specificity right away. We have to build alignment and understanding. And to do that, that takes a lot of work. There's these deliverables here, but there's many others as well. And that brings me to the second learning that we've had that I want to share with you now, which is that for us, our hardest work is before production. And in a way, we have our framework, ironically, to like blame for this. You know, we've sort of front-loaded more and more of our work and more of our deliverables before we get into production. Over the years, we've learned that the later we make changes and the later we do some things, the costlier and more painful it becomes, especially when we start building final assets. And so because those changes become exponentially harder, we've decided as a team that we want to invest in tackling these things early. Our average champion production schedule is nine months, and that's just on average. And so for a lot of our champions, before we ever make a final asset, it can be five months in previous phases. And we found that that actually has a lot of value for us. All right, so let's get into production. Production is not easy. I know that I said our hardest work was before this. Um, champion, uh, production's an exciting time. Everyone's working on different assets, we're integrating them all together, we're seeing how they feel, and inevitably there's some changes that we want to make. But because we've done some due diligence before this, we can usually roll with those changes without impacting our overall schedule. And ultimately our goal for 
production is to get the champion in a content complete state with enough polish that we can start video taping and, and sort of creating video content to show players. And we do this because we want to engage and excite our players with new champion content. But we also want to you know, release this content before the champion comes out so that players can get an understanding of what's coming and what are the abilities here. I want to share with you one of the new features that we needed to build for Jin. We needed to create a new UI HUD element. A core part of Jin's gameplay is that he has four shots, and then he needs to take a pause and reload. And we needed to be able to communicate this mechanic to players in a really clear way. Unfortunately, we don't have any interface designers on the champion team, or anyone with like, really that skill set. And so we have to partner with another team, and this is where that scalability thing comes into play that I was talking about earlier. Our framework really helped create an easy partnership with our other team because we were able to say, hey, here's where we're at with Jin. Here are the goals that we have. Here are the deliverables that we need along the way. How can we partner with you and add your deliverables into this process? And it's awesome that this helps us work and align with other teams as well. And as a result, our newer champions have more new features than ever before. So we move into our next stage from production, which is post-production. This is when we release the champion. And I think um, in order to really explain how this works, I should tell you a little bit about how League of Legends delivers new content to players. So we try to release a new patch of content every two weeks worldwide. But before that patch goes wide, we upload it to our PBE, or public beta, server. And players can play the PBE server and give us feedback. And so for us on champion team, you know, releasing a champion isn't like a singular moment in time. It's actually the process of many weeks. And we're you know, taking feedback. And one of our biggest goals is to release the champion in a healthy, awesome state, and definitely in a balanced state. And so I apologize. Let's, let's get up some, some of this content. So we've created what we call a balanced mitigation plan. This plan has a bunch of different balance outcomes and scenarios that could come to pass, and all of the things that we're gonna do to address those. Now, those balance concerns really often never come, but we found that it has helped us do that exercise, so that if, does, if something does happen, we're able to, able to quickly react to it. And if you play League, you may challenge me on Jin's balance currently, and I encourage you to give that feedback directly to Greg Street tomorrow if you go to his talk. So after post-production, we're in our final phase. This is called sustain. And this is where Jin currently is, and all 134 of our champions live. And we have some clear deliverables at this phase. You know, we archive all of our development assets. We set up some partnerships with our other teams in League of Legends and how we're going to support Jin in the future. And we hold project retrospectives with the team. But Overall, we're really still trying to figure out a good goal and good deliverables here. And that leads me to the final learning that I want to share with you all today. And that's, our framework's never done, and it always needs improvement. And if you create something like this, I'm betting yours will also be in this situation. But ultimately, that's OK. This framework is cheap to iterate on, cheap to create, and it encourages that constant iteration. And what we found as a team is that the more that we work on this, the more we get benefits like scalability and clarity. And it gives us a stronger and stronger foundation of which to stand on as a team, which in turn has given us more and more of creative energy to focus on delivering innovative and resonant champions to League of Legends players. I want to thank you all so, so much for coming to this talk and for your time. Thank you. That's my um, Twitter if you want to send me tips on how to take better team photos or give me feedback or continue talking about this, please uh, feel free. And I think we've got uh, five minutes for Q&A. So I apologize, I can't really see you, but go ahead. Hello. Hi. So I have a question about your framework. You mentioned the different phases. And I wanted to know if they are time boxed, like you have a specific time to reach these phases, or it's more like you iterate until 
you're yeah. ready for to go to the next phase? No, that's a good question. So the question was, do we have a time box on each of these phases? And the answer is kind of. We have some best practices that we found over the years of like, it should take us about this amount of time in discovery and about this amount of time in ideation and so forth. But these are just guidelines. We've had, I would say all of our champions have broken some, some of those guidelines at some point. And we just use that as a way of kind of gut checking ourselves where we're at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question over here. Yeah. Um, what's your rate of atrophy between these different phases? Like you sort of said, uh, some, a lot of uh, champions don't make it to the next step. How much you're getting lost along the way at each of those steps, roughly? Yeah, a lot. So it's, it's kind of hard to keep track of that data specifically. I will say that we cycle and churn through stuff in discovery pretty frequently. And we have this concept that we call iceboxing. So if a champion isn't kind of moving forward and not getting traction, we put it in the ice box, which means we've got a kind of backlog collection of concepts that we can pull from in the future. But are you losing them later steps also? Or are you, once they reach a certain point, do they always go all the way through? It's pretty unusual that we sort of lose a champion after ideation. And okay. the main reason for that is because we have some really hardcore design deliverables in there, um, like pattern lock. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Hi there, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, regarding champion reworks, do you happen to find yourself starting at earlier points in the process, or do you tend to get a little bit of a head start due to that? Repeat the question. Oh, great. Okay. So the, the question was about champion reworks and do we use the same framework? So, uh, uh, was that the question? More or less, yeah. Okay. So, um, champion updates is actually a, um, a sister team, a partner team to champion. Um, they use a similar process, but not exactly this framework. Uh, you know, there are a lot of similarities for how we work on the teams, but I don't want to try to give specifics on, on their process. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. He might have already answered my question, or you might have already just answered my question, but so you guys don't handle the maintaining of the champions? That's another team that does that? Uh, so the question is, do we handle maintaining the, the champions or not? It depends on your definition of maintaining. So we have a responsibility and a commitment to players and to our organization that we will continuously um, take care of our champions. And so when bugs come up or certain issues, the champion team is accountable for making sure they're resolved. There's, um, there are other teams within the League of Legends sort of organization that look at things like visual game updates for sort of their large scale reworks, um, as well as sort of specific balance passes, or we do things like roster updates. Essentially, there's a lot of teams working on champions, and um, we're just one of them. Okay, and how do you handle scaling out? So obviously, the more champions you have, the harder it gets to actually handle all of these different things. So how do you handle? Yeah scaling out your team, do you just grow exponentially the more champions you have? Uh, okay, so the question is how do we scale, or, or sort of what are the challenges around scaling as the more champions that we have? I think that, that kind of gets at the heart of the challenges that we have around our current sustain phase. The more champions that we have, the more we need to just double down on our commitment to maintaining them. We are still trying to figure that out. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've noticed that some champions come out with uh, these really elaborate videos and you know comics and all that kind of things, and other champions kind of just come out. Um, is that considered as part of the design process to say you know this this champion needs this video kind of explain their lore so you understand them, or is that kind of added later in the process? Um, the question was you know how do how does the sort of like supplementary and then sort of promotional content work for releasing new champions. It's, um, my response is, I feel like going to be long-winded, but I'm going to try to just cut to the chase, which is um, there's another partner team that we have, Champion Publishing, that partners really early with us on like, how can we best tell players the story of who this champion is, and is the most effective tool to do that a comic, or is it a video, or is it an interactive website, or Easter eggs, or stories? We're always like, trying to innovate and think of new things to do there. Um, so the process starts really early, and we, we partner with um, another team on that all the way. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks. All right, I think we're at time. Thank you guys so much for coming today, and please hit me up if you have any other questions. Thank you.